Thank you. As I mentioned at the beginning of the program, have an opportunity to spend some time with one of the candidates running for the U.S. Senate. He is Republican Pat Toomey, former congressman from the Lehigh Valley and also represented parts of Montgomery County. And Pat, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me, Daryl. How are you? Uh, I am well. Where, where are you today? Are you in the Lehigh Valley? I am in my Allentown office. Allentown office. You didn't get hit by too much snow today, did you? you get, no, uh, we've got, um, you know, it's snowing pretty steadily, but it hasn't accumulated very much. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's it's happened. still snowing. Oh, it's still snowing. Yeah. Oh, really? How about that? Now, what's, uh, I, I was talking earlier at how much problems even a little bit of snow can, can create. So we had accidents oh, yeah. and delayed school openings and all of that, but I'm I'm glad to know that you're uh, safe and warm right now. And uh, uh, Talk to me a, a little bit about your take on where we are with health care reform. I know we've talked about this topic on this program before, and you've got a lot of concern about the uh, direction Congress seems to be moving in. Uh, I'm as disturbed as much by the process yeah. as, I, as I am with the, the product or what I think is going to be the product. What's your take on it? Well, I think the process is, is terrible. Uh, how else could you describe it? And uh, it is a direct contradiction to what the president repeatedly promised in the campaign, as I'm sure you remember. Mm-hmm. He insisted that it was going to be open and transparent, and he was very specific. He said, we're going to have C-SPAN in the room. Everyone is going to be televised. There will not be back room secret deals. Uh, we're going to have this discussion uh, in the in the um, uh, you know the antiseptic sun uh, of, of sunlight, and 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 that's what we should do. We should have an open process, but we don't. We have a a backroom process. Republicans are completely excluded from any consideration or any discussion, and we saw what this process uh, produces in the Senate, Daryl. Uh, arrangements whereby a single state gets to be exempted from uh, the cost of uh, the, uh, the Medicaid cost that would be imposed on all the other states. Yeah. So Pennsylvania, for instance, in addition to being forced to uh, incur higher Medicaid costs ourselves, we're also going to pay for uh, Nebraska's uh, higher Medicaid costs, simply because Ben Nelson held out and sold his vote for a higher price than our senators did. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we find out that uh, there are three counties in Florida that will not be subject to the Medicare cuts. Now, all the other counties in America pretty much are going to are going to be subject to those cuts in Medicare. Yeah. But uh, the the Florida senator uh, said, "Well, if you want my vote, we're going to have to exempt these counties." So, so it's a terrible process. It's just absolutely uh, horrendous, and it is leading to a very bad product. And and it is part of uh, you know one of the things that uh, Barack Obama said when he was a candidate was, was it, he was and a lot of people expected that he was going to be a transformational figure in terms of how government was done versus right. the way government would be done. But, you know, and you hear the term once in a while, Chicago-style politics, yeah. where he came from, and it does seem to be more of the same. Well, that's right. And, you know, he, he promised us uh, that uh, it wouldn't be more of the same. And the fact is, it's true that this is uh, Congress that is uh, engaging in this, uh, in this particularly reprehensible behavior in this, with regard to this bill. But if President Obama came out publicly and said, I'm going to insist that we do this in a transparent process, they would have to go along. There's no way they could not. And, in fact, let's face it, the White House is at the negotiating table as well. At the end of the day, nothing comes out of this conference that hasn't already been blessed by the White House uh, because they're not going to send uh, a bill to the president that he can't sign. So so the president is, is every bit as much to blame as Nancy Pelosi and, and Harry Reid, and I, I just think it's it's very unfortunate. Is there a, do you sense a momentum for change? Change was, of course, the, the motto two years ago, but, but it seems like there may be an even greater change in this election cycle. You've already had uh, Dodd from Connecticut right. and Dorgan from, uh, where is he, from North Dakota or South Dakota? From North, North Dakota. One yeah. of those Dakotas out right. there. Right. Uh, they've already announced that they are not going to seek re-election, right. and there does seem to be this desire for change, yeah. a dissatisfaction with what people thought they were going to get two years ago, and a desire for some other kind of change. Well, I, that's exactly right. The fact is uh, very many people voted last year for change, and that was uh, Barack Obama's great strength was that he appealed to many people across a, a broad spectrum as a, an agent for change with the hope that uh, it would be constructive change. But, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm here to tell you 
that uh, what they have been doing is not the change that people had in mind. Uh, people did not believe uh, and did not really vote for a massive expansion of the federal government. They didn't vote to have serial bailouts of failing companies, which continue to this day. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, another $3.8 billion taxpayer dollars going into GMAC. The caps lifted entirely on the amount of subsidies that taxpayers are going to have to put into Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Mm -hmm. So the serial bailouts continue. Spending is at a breathtaking and staggering and totally unsustainable level. You know, I was very critical of budget deficits last year when they hit $469 billion, and I argued that's too big, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's dangerous, and it's and it's just not right. Well, this year it's $1.4 trillion. It's mm -hmm. three times last year's level, and it's going to be another $1.4 trillion next year. It, this is... This is not what people uh, voted for, having government uh, uh, take enormous control over health care is not a priority of, of uh, the folks of Pennsylvania that I talked to. They want to get our, our economy going again. They want to see job creation and a, fisc and a government that's living within its means, and, and that's what we need to be focused on. What, what, is your, what are the ramifications of running those kinds of deficits? What is the impact of this going to be on the economy? Great question. Great question. And, and I think that, first of all, uh, they're very, very negative, but it's hard to know exactly how it manifests itself, um, mm -hmm. and the timing is difficult to know. But when you impose an unprecedented and staggering amount of debt, uh, at some point something gives. So one thing that can happen is we can discover that we're unable to sell the, the, the staggering volume of treasuries that we need to sell. Mm -hmm. It's called a failed auction when the government shows up to sell a bunch of treasuries to raise a bunch of money and there aren't enough buyers out there to, make, to, uh, to, to buy all that the Treasury needs to issue. And then what happens? Well, that's a huge problem yeah. uh, because, uh, you know, then how do you pay your bills? Where do we go uh, then, yeah. Then, then where do you go? Exactly. No, it's a huge problem. And the, the obvious um, most immediate consequence typically is a huge increase in interest rates. Mm -hmm. Eventually you can get people to lend the money, but you have to pay them much, much higher interest rates in order to persuade them to do so. That's one scenario. The other scenario that worries me uh, just as much, Daryl, is when you consider the staggering amount of money that the Fed has pumped into the system, the fact that, that the Fed is monetizing some of this debt, by mm -hmm. which you know that, that means the Fed is simply printing the money mm -hmm. to then give it to the Treasury. Um, the danger that we have a collapse of the dollar or a huge surge of inflation is a very real danger. And, and, and until, unless we get our fiscal house in order, I, I think that's actually inevitable at some point. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I and you know, huge inflation means that everybody who's a saver uh, is in deep trouble because what you've saved is no longer worth very much. Mm -hmm. um, people who have fixed income suddenly discover that all of the daily necessities cost much, much more. This is not unprecedented. In fact, it's happened many times in our own history. You know, a, a, a U.S. dollar today is worth a small fraction of what it was worth. 50 or 60 years ago, uh, and, and, you know, it could happen all over again. Uh, it's terrible for our economy, it's terrible for job creation, and it's terrible for uh, people who have saved and people who live on a fixed income. Is there, is there going to be enough of a political backlash to change the direction the government is moving in, even if there are changes, as one would suspect in the Senate and the House, is there enough to change the direction that this is all moving in? That, you know, that's the that's the sixty four thousand dollar question. Uh, you know, I, I have been campaigning uh, since the, since I got into this race, and I'll continue to campaign for ending bailouts and fiscal sanity, and and getting uh, the economy moving again in the private sector, which is the only source of uh, real growth and sustainable jobs. Um, my my opponents, whether it's Joe Sestak or our inspector, they are big advocates and have supported all the bailouts, all the stimulus bill. They want more stimulus. They want to continue to grow government. So we're going to have a big debate in Pennsylvania. We, you know, which direction do we want to go in? Now, if guys like me, if I can win this race, as I think I will, and if candidates like me uh, in other states and other congressional districts win, then I do think we will be able to change this direction and get back on a more uh, – rational and, and responsible uh, fiscal footing uh, but it's really, it's going to it's going to be determined by the outcome of elections next uh, this year later this year Joe Sestak was on the program earlier this week and, and to me Joe Sestak is is sort of a, a classic liberal candidate in that he truly believes in in government activism and and he believes that that is 
the direction that the country should go, and that, that is the role of the federal government. What is your take on, on the votes that Arlen Specter has cast in terms of uh, whether he is a true believer or he is doing some of what he is doing for political expedience now that he's on the other side? Well, uh, let me first say I completely share your assessment of Joe Sestak. I also happen to find him a likable guy, yeah. and, he's, and he's a bright guy. Mm -hmm. He's a very, very liberal man. He is to the left of Barack Obama on virtually every domestic policy issue that I can think of. He is in lockstep with Nancy Pelosi. He is an, an advocate, a very uh, forceful advocate for a much bigger uh, federal government, higher taxes, more spending. Uh, that That is clearly something he believes strongly in. His voting record is consistent with it, and he's campaigning with it. So I give Joe credit for being a principal liberal. There's only one principle that's important to our inspector, and that's his own reelection. And I think that's abundantly clear. This man will join any party. He'll take any position. He'll say anything. I mean, uh, where to begin? Uh, you know, when he announced that he was leaving the Republican Party, one of the things he said was, I will continue to be independent. I will not be a rubber stamp for the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. As soon as Joe Sestak emerged as a serious primary challenge, Arlen Specter lost all independence and precisely became the rubber stamp that he is. He has been voting in lockstep with Harry Reid. You notice there was no discussion about him holding out for anything on uh, as there was with respect to Ben Nelson and Blanche Lincoln and other Democrats in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Arlen Specter has been as liberal as he can be and he will continue to do that for as long as he needs to in this Democratic primary. If he managed to win the primary, oh, he'll do 180 all over again. But remember, this is a guy who was in favor of the card check, you know, the legislation to deny workers a secret mm -hmm. ballot when voting on the union. Uh, he was opposed to it. Uh, then, uh, no, no, he, he was initially for it. Then when he thought he was running against me in a Republican primary, he came out against it. Then when he joined the Democrats, he's for it again. Likewise, 180-degree reversal on the government-run health care, on our, our troop level in Afghanistan, on gay marriage. I mean, it's it's actually it's sad to see it. I mean, this is a man who who is is just desperate, and uh, it, it's quite clear there are no guiding principles except whatever he thinks is in his short-term political interest. Well, it's certainly going to be interesting to follow that that Democratic primary coming up in the spring. And uh, the general election, too, promises to be interesting as well in Pennsylvania. And we've got a governor's race and the Senate race and uh, yeah. uh, a, a lot, lot of things to follow. That's right. Yeah, it's going to be a very a very interesting year. I think it's a very important year because we're really at, a, at an inflection point. We have a, a, you know, a very liberal wing of the Democratic Party is in complete control of the agenda in Washington. We have one-party rule right now. And they've been very clear about where they want to go. They have a very liberal agenda. I think they, they really want to move us in the direction of the European welfare state model as opposed to the traditional American model of uh, democratic free enterprise. So uh, we're going to have, uh, in some ways, I think, Darrell, what we could view as a referendum on that, that approach, that philosophy, that remaking of, uh, of our society. I, I think people are going to vote to... Uh, to keep the traditional America. We're, we're, we're out of time, but I hope we talk again soon. Well, thanks for having me, Daryl. I'd love to come back. Pat Toomey, appreciate it. Uh, Republican candidate running for the U.S. Senate.